Okay, hit that read. Yes, sir. Got Sean, I do have one question. Yeah. My wife, I just realized it after you said this. Oh, sorry. Yeah. The Bibles, the different versions of the Bibles. Um, I have the NIV that I've been using for some time. Being military, we've gone to different churches and have stepped into non-denominational Christian churches as well, and all the different Bibles. Why do you use the one that you use, and what's your what's your perspective of the different Bibles? Good question. Yeah, good question. Incredible question. All right. Let's get started. I'm going to get a marker. No, I don't <laughs> All that's up there is a red. The red doesn't show up very good. What color do you prefer? Anything dark? All right, you can take Bibles, you can take all English Bibles, all French Bibles, all German Bibles, and you can divide them up into two categories, two groupings. One is a formal equivalency, and the other is a dynamic <coughs> equivalency. And dynamic equivalency. All right. And even if that's not spelled right, you know what word I'm using, equivalency. Okay. All right. So, what, what, preacher, what in the world is that all about? All right, another way of saying it is word for word and thought for thought. Okay, thought for thought. That's another way of saying it. So how many in this room speak more than one language? How many in this room speak more than one language? You speak more than one language. Yeah, toss it up your brother. Thank you. You speak, anyone else speak more than one language in this room? Just one, okay. Well, um, Spanish, I assume, is that correct? All right. Sometimes it's hard to find the right English word for the Spanish word or the Spanish word for the English word. Is that true? It's not easy just to immediately go word for word, word for word. Okay? So you, your Bible is either a word for word in general or a thought for th thought translation in general. You got one of the two choices. In other words, you go, this is the Greek word. What English word should I use? This is the Greek word. What English word should I use? Or you go, this is the Greek phrase. What English phrase should I use? Okay, there's the difference. This is the intent or the thought that's trying to be communicated. The thought with a U. And this is the English thought that best replicates it. Or you decide to go, doesn't matter. We're just going to do our very best of going Greek to English, 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 and you move them from one language to the other, move them from one language to the other. So those are your two general parameters. All Bibles can be divided up into those two general ideas. So the King James Bible is a very literal word-for-word -word translation. It, it's excellent for studying Greek because you can get, okay, what, this is the English word, what's the Greek word behind it, this is the English word, what's the Greek word behind it, this is the English word, what's the Greek word behind it. The difficulty is, sometimes it renders it choppy, sometimes it renders it difficult to understand. The, uh, probably a, a, a great dynamic equivalency, that would be the smooth reading, thought for thought, would be the New Living Translation, the New Living Translation. So between this Bible, the King James over here, and over here, the New Living Translation, is a plethora of choices, as you well know, a plethora of choices. The NIV would fall right here. They would say, they're doing their very best, the committee, I would say, would say, we're doing our very best <coughs> to take these two and merge them into one translation. <coughs> so we're going to do our best to be literal in translating, and yet also try to maintain smooth thought-for-thought -thought ideas. Okay? Every other translation is going to fall somewhere along here. Fall somewhere along here as that. Now, having said that, having said that, there is another group or individuals on the planet, and predominantly in America, that would not use this. They would use this. 
There's one letter difference. You see what the letter difference is? It's the B. They would say, this is not a version. They would say, this is the Bible. This is the Bible. Okay? They would say that at 1611, those guys were given supernatural, more than what everyone else got, direction, guidance to give us, and they would use words like a pure, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, uh, describing this as no one. Now, this is the same book. This is all about perception. This is all about view. This is all about philosophy. That is to say that something unique and special happened when these guys began moving from Greek to English, Hebrew to English, that nobody else has ever had or should have. Okay? Um, this is a small minority camp in America. This is a tiny minority camp. Um, normally, these people, this grouping here, are pretty extreme in everything else also. It seems to work together. That they can't seem to give any flexibility. Because they don't give flexibility in the translation issue, they really don't give flexibility in dress or music or anything else. So it's a really a narrow grouping of people. Okay? Um, the other thing that you need to be aware of as we discuss this issue just briefly is you have manuscripts. All right? There are approximately 5,500 manuscripts that support the King James Bible or, or the support the Greek the, to support the Greek New Testament. 5,500 just in Greek alone. All right, not every manuscript is exactly the same. Not every manuscript is exactly the same. Now we wish they were. Zach, there's no modern reproduction capabilities back then. Everything is handwritten. Everything is handwritten. And there's mistakes. There's mistakes. There's there's pen errors. There's no way around it. For example, uh, a, a, a simple difference in manuscripts might be we could have three manuscripts from a particular passage in the New Testament. And one might say Lord, another one might say Jesus, another one might say Lord Jesus. Okay? <coughs> subject's not changed. Exact same subject. We all know who we're talking about. We're talking about the Christ, Jesus, the Lord. But depending upon who was copying it, would determine whether they said Lord or Jesus or Lord Jesus. Okay? Now you don't have this problem in the Hebrew Bible. And I will tell you why you don't. In the Hebrew Bible, the copying of the Old Testament was supervised by a group of Masoretes in very open, well-lighted conditions. And they would, if you were in charge, Kent, of copying, I would be your supervisor. And you had page number 442, and there were 742 characters on page that page I just said. My job would be to count those characters. So I would just go, and that's all I would do. If you came, gave me a document that had one or more characters than what it was, I'd just burn it. And you start all over. So you're getting paid to copy all day long. I'm getting paid to supervise, and there's someone above me that's getting paid to supervise me. Now, the reason for this is it's the Jewish Bible. It's completely lawful. It's open air, well lighted conditions. Now, what do you know about the Christian church in those early days? Was it lawful? What? Someone said it. They were being persecuted. So all this copying, all this copying occurs in closed doors, not well-lighted conditions, under duress, private. I've got a copy of Paul's letter. Zach, you want to borrow it? I sneak it to you. You copy a copy. You sneak it over to him. You do it at nighttime. You do it on candlelight. There isn't anyone checking your quality. There isn't anyone checking mine. Because I've got a copy, and you want a copy. You share your copy with Kent. You both share your copy with Brian. Kyle gets a copy. And, and, and none of you are being oversight. There's anyone counting characters because you're just trying to get the Word of God into your home. Remember, there's no Xerox machines. Mike to walk up to and go, 2-5. It's all done by hand. Thus, 
if you look at manuscripts, you will see differences. You will see differences. There, we don't need to stick our head in the sand and pretend like there aren't differences. There are minor differences. And so sometimes what happens is A, B, or C. Now, you're on, Mike is on a translation committee for the ESV. That's the English Standard Version. It just came out a few years ago. And we're at Acts chapter number 2. And we're now moving from Greek, Greek to English. And we've got to pick as a committee, are we going to use A, are we going to use B, or are we going to use C? And that's where your minor differences occur. But right. isn't, it, isn't that how they derived the KJV anyways? They did the same thing. Sure, they all did the same thing. The King James guys did the exact same thing. What I'm saying to you is that they may have picked B, and the ESV comes along 200 years, 300, 400 years later and says, no, we really don't think that B was the original thing. We think A was the, the right choice. More information has been revealed, more has been taught, more has been learned. There's a different philosophy in the room. There's a different direction. Now remember, we're not talking about changing the subject. We're not, we're not going, hey, we really thought it was so-and-so, but it wasn't. No, no, we're talking about do you render it Lord? Do you render it Jesus? Do you render it Lord Jesus? Do you render it Lord Jesus Christ? So, a King James guy picked version C, <coughs> which has one, two, three references to Christ, the NIV guy goes, you know what, I really think that Paul probably just said Jesus. So all they, they pick B, and then these nuts in this camp right here go, look, you missed two words. And the King James is better than the NIV because it has more references to Jesus. And that's, I'm just telling you, that's how it works. That's the general gist of how it works. Okay? Um, the other thing that you need to recognize that contributes to our discrepancies or our differences is consider for a moment with me and we'll get into our lesson in just a minute consider for a moment with me the difference between translating in the year 1611 and translating in the year 2000 and just consider the differences. All right? If you were on the ESV translation committee in the year 2000, what kind of conditions do you think you'd be working in? What kind of room do you think Crossway, that's the publisher, would be paying for you to work in? What kind of conditions? Air conditioned. Like this. Air conditioned? What? Like this. Like this. Fluorescent lights. You reckon there'd be some computers in that room? Sure. Yeah. Right. Okay. What do you think it would have been like to work? under the conditions in 1611? Like do they have fluorescent lights? No. What about their communication between rooms? How do you think their communication was? You think they had an IM, an instant message, or a chat box that they could communicate? To? Messenger. No. Yeah. Right. So, so what, what you have is, for example, you have Mark and Marcus. Same person. Same person in King James. It's not rendered the same. It's not consistent. Why isn't it consistent? Well, I think, and I wasn't there. <coughs> wow. <laughs> I'm going to preach to you guys in a little while. That was funny. That's the best you're going to get. All right. I think, I think you got different rooms. You got different floors. I think this is the first Timothy room, or the Timothy room, and this is the Mark room. These guys are doing Mark, and these guys are doing Timothy. And they're not going to run back and forth and talk to each other every single time there's a question going on as to how they're rendering something. When they run into the Greek word, which the, the most accurate rendering is Marcus. If you look at the Greek word, the most accurate rendering is Marcus. And so they, these guys go with Marcus. These guys go with Mark. And they don't communicate. Now when you pull up the ESV, for example, there's no differences. Why do you think that is? Same person. And I think that like you know, we've had 400 years of criticizing and analyzing the word differences in the King James Version, and so you know we've only had a couple of years to criticize ESV, but they don't need it as much because you know we've it's not been 400 years of people picking over it and, and seeing what the problems are. Mm -hmm. Right, but don't you think that the, the, you got like you said, Kyle, which is great, great insight. 
they're not going to make those same kind of differences. They know where, where the differences are. They're looking for it. So they're going to decide from the very beginning, are we going with Marcus or are we going with Mark? And then everybody has to go with that. It doesn't matter whether you're in the Timothy room, you're in the Mark room, you're in the Matthew room, because a definitive ruling has been made. And think about how easy it would be to communicate. I remember when I was over in Iraq and I was working on division staff in uh, Air Mahdi, and we had little chat windows that we would communicate in. And I could be communicating with people in Kuwait and in Saudi and in Baghdad on these little chat windows. And I would have eight windows open at a different time. And that would be my Saudi window, my Kuwait window, my Baghdad window, uh, all the way around. And I could just reach out and talk to anybody. Well, there's no doubt that in a translation committee team working together, they're going to do that same level of communication. Hey, hey, we're over here, we're dealing with this. What did you guys do? What decision did you make? And they, they can communicate. So th this helps me explain to you, hopefully, why this is this way and this is this way and the differences. Okay, Could they have had better um, transcripts to go to for the King James that may not exist now? I don't think that we've lost any transcripts. I would argue with you that it's the reverse. That, for example, with the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls yes. in the 1900s, that we have more transcripts available to us than they did back then. Actually, their primary tool was not the transcripts. Their primary tool was the previous Bibles. For example, the Cloverdale is a previous Bible. Um, the Tyndale Bible, William Tyndale. So if you look at the Tyndale Bible, for example, you'll see it's almost identical to the King James Bible. It's a hundred years earlier than that. Um, and so in many ways, they just render it the exact same way if, if, unless there was a question or an issue with it. But again, that was a situation in which, like Kyle made, that in 1600s, they're now able to pick over the Tyndale and say, we're going to make it better. What's really interesting, and these folks right here with their heads in the sand, and I'm just going to kind of be rude, they don't want you to read the preface to the uh, authorized version, because if you would read the actual preface that the King James Translation Committee wrote about their own work, they would say, please make it better. They say it. They say it. They say, hey, this is our best effort, and we're expecting people to make it better. We know this is our best effort. One of the things, unfortunately, that if you look at a King James Bible today, if you have your King James Bible or a King James Bible, one of the things that was not preserved, unfortunately, is all the margin renderings. In the 1611 Bible, if you go online, or you can actually buy them now, but they're available because we're celebrating the 400-year anniversary this year, you can get yourself an original 1611 Bible. You will see a center column full of margin renderings because they go, hey, we don't know what to do here. So what do you do when you don't know what to do? You put one here and you put your caveat in your margin. You say, we're not sure to choose this one or this one. We don't know whether it's A or B. We're divided. We're in this room right here and 60% and are saying A and 40% are saying, you're wrong, it's B. And we're just divided. So what kind of compromise are we going to issue? We, put, we take the 60%, that goes in the text, and we put a footnote for the other 40% so that you know that your contribution or your thought has been heard. Unfortunately, as they moved to printing, all those margin notes just went away. went away. They just went away. So then, I don't, I don't mean lost in the sense of we can't find them. They're still there. You could go on the internet and find it tomorrow, I mean today, just like that. But in the sense of repeating it. So then, when the new translations came on board, one of the first ones being the NIV, and it was filled with margin notes, Everyone went, oh, look, look, look at all these margin notes. These people right here. And they just had a cow with the margin notes. How disingenuous. Their very 1611 Bible that they love also had margin notes. Because when we run into situations, we're not sure about them. We're just not sure about them. All right. Did that answer your question? Yes, sir. Yeah. So we use the King James Bible because we've always used the King James Bible, brother. But I will tell you right now. I study out of everything I can get my hands on. I study out of everything I can get my hands on. Unfortunately, I've got a great computer program that just <laughs> guides me and guides me and guides me. It makes it so easy for me to compare translations. Because quite frankly, I would never want to teach something that I could only show you in one translation. I just wouldn't want to do that. I wouldn't want to teach something 
that was built around one single rendering of Scripture. Do you know what I mean by that? That you could only see this truth in the King James, that you couldn't find this truth. Well, what if I was overseas somewhere? What if I was in Ukraine? They're not going to have a King James Bible in Ukraine. I want to make sure that the truth I'm teaching could be taught in uh, uh, Mexico or in Puerto Rico. And they're not going to have a King James translation. All right.